The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Your world is changing, just to let you know that. You don't have as much time as you think. I don't want to sound morbid behind that, but you don't. People are already planning for the inevitable. It's just that the inevitable is not publicized throughout the world. And so people really believe they have years ahead of them, and they don't. The Lord told us to be ready always. He reminded us that none of us are promised tomorrow. In other words, concentrate on today, not tomorrow. Don't live in tomorrow. Don't live in yesterday. But concentrate on this day. Believe me, it can take you through some times, and some very rough times sometimes. It can take you through battles. It can take you through just about everything. If you concentrate in this moment and find your Father in this moment, it will carry you through. Because to find your Father, you're going to have to be mindful about what He said. And as soon as you do that, Satan has lost control of your situation. If you don't do that, Satan will toy with you, play with you for a maximum effect. He, he wants that maximum effect, which is normally shock and awe. If he can establish shock and awe in your life, which is something happens to you that you really don't expect. If he can really do this in your life, he can throw you off your footing. And normally when people are thrown off, they start doing things they shouldn't. They make bad choices and it's a snowball effect in their life. And before you know it, everything is turned upside down. Well, let, let me break it down to you this way. You ready for this? Who is raising you in the earth? Who's raising you? A lot of people saying, Jesus, yes, that's right. The Lord is raising you. He's raising you. Now, in the phases of your life, did you know him? Were you? Did you know him so well at the beginning of your life that you did not fornicate do all those things? Did you ever steal something, have a bad idea, have bad dreams? Were you over overtaken with lust? Were you ever overtaken with lust and things like that? Didn't you want to have something in the world? You saw the world as this magical, beautiful place where things were possible. You thought that people were loving this and the other. Come to find out we were totally wrong about the characteristics of most things that we saw when we were young. So we were 100% beguiled. But wait a minute. If the Father's raising us, that's part of his process, isn't it? To have you immersed in a little bit of filth. And if that's the Father's process, then we can look back in history and see his process upon every single nation he had anything to do with and see the exact same process. Remember that term, born into sin? If you're born into sin, you're not clean at birth. Forget it. It's almost like saying, you know, children are so innocent. Are you kidding me? Put some cookies on the counter. We'll see how innocent that child is. So we go through phases of growth that are important. But the way God does, he sends us through these phases. But what is that called? When you give in to sin in your younger days, right? Like Paul did, like Peter did, John, all these guys. What is that called when you partake of sin? What is that called when you admit something like Jeremiah? And Jeremiah said, no, no, I can't be a prophet. I'm unclean. You can't call me for that. What is that? When people admit the truth about themselves and they end up having the exact same story, save Melchizedek and, and two, three others. What is that called? That's called God's process. But it's also called he immerses you in truth, not a lie. He doesn't have you watching these things from a window. Your adversary, he put you right down in the midst of your adversary. Do you know that? That's what he did. God is the one that told us that Lucifer is the God of this world. Satan is the God of this world. By the, way, by the way, Satan is a titan, but he's the God of this world. And what does God do? He allows us to be born in this world where Lucifer or Satan is the God of this world. And then we are directly exposed to darkness. What is that called? That's called truth. God has raised you in an atmosphere of truth. And how is it truth? Because you're exposed to darkness. You're exposed to these bad situations. You are partakers of iniquity. Then when you reach a certain age, you say, wait a minute, that's not my life. How did you ever come to that conclusion? How did you come to the conclusion that all this darkness and all this other stuff is not you? I'll tell you why. Because when you were engaged in it, so long as it was good, you were okay with it. So long as you were the benefactor, you were okay with it. But when it turned on you and it bit you, when the serpent bit you, 
it hurt. And you said, I don't like this. When you said, I don't like this, I don't belong to this in my heart of hearts, this is not what I want, that's the identification phase. That's the only way you'll ever know who you truly belong to, is to be exposed truthfully to both. That's like a child and two parents that broke up. You don't separate the child from the one parent or do all the... No, you let the child get to know the parents. And trust me, they will in time see for themselves who is who. All you have to do is keep living faithfully. And the Lord will raise them in this process like he raised you. The more truth you know, the better off you are. Like right now, a lot of people are saying, boy, people are acting weird and strange and evil. No, they're not. You're starting to see the truth of people. Listen, the truth of a person is not when they smile, give hugs and shake hands because everything is going well. The truth of a person is to meet them when everything is going wrong. That's who you know who that person is. If you meet a person and everything is going right, that's not who the person is. When everything goes wrong, when they start losing things, when they're under pressure on a continuous basis, that's who the person is. Do you guys see that, right? That's called facing the truth. The Father works by way of truth in everything he does. He does not manipulate. He doesn't scheme. He doesn't do any of those things. That's what human beings do. That's what Satan does. Our Father does not do that. He exposes us to truth. When you see the truth of another person, normally it comes out in a very difficult time. Only when things are favorable to them again, they ever be nice again. Otherwise, you're going to see who they really are. And it takes time. When a person starts acting out of the norm, they start acting like right now, lots of people are going nuts. But see, even, even now you have to be patient. Here's why. A lot of these people have had the silver spoon up until this point. And when the silver spoon is taken away, of course, they're going to be thrust into the world of truth. What is that truth? That darkness is not good. That all these things they were involved with are not good. They're going to be immersed in this. And then, of course, their reaction is going to be, uh, you know, a little different than normal. You have to give them time. You have to be patient. They're being raised just like you are. You were just called earlier than them. That's all. You can't turn your back on a person because their process began later than yours. God called you first to get you in position so that you could see these folks going through their process. But let me share this. If you deny your own process, you're going to miss the whole thing. Why does time continue to go on? Because God desires that no one perish outside of him. Can we say the same? But see, I have a problem in one area. I'll save that with you. I, I share that with you guys in COT. I have a problem in one area. Now, I'm, I'm just being honest because people who do specific things, I don't have a heart for those folks. That's why I need my Lord and Savior big time in my life. I don't have a heart for folks who do this certain thing. To be, if it were left to me, they would not be on the face of the earth. But that's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. And that must be purged for me because that's not trusting the ways of my Lord. That may seem noble, but it's not. It's ignorance. Process is very important. Right now, you're seeing people. They're unzipping all over the place. Why? Because they're being exposed to a lot of darkness is starting to see darkness is biting them some of your brothers and your sisters are in these crowds because darkness is biting them see when darkness is exposed and if darkness bites another piece of itself they're going to join forces or they're going to fight and enjoy the fight hear me on this darkness will often fight itself and enjoy the fight it does that to drag you in and to put your light out cause you to take a side and put your light out. It'll make you, you'll side with darkness without ever knowing this is how Satan works by beguilement. Satan does not jump out and advertise himself and say, hello, I'm Satan. I'm going out to deceive you. It, that's not how he works. He works in very tiny, small steps. He's very methodical. He does not give up. He will draw you in, make you take a side in every way that he can. And when you do this, you become a partaker of darkness on one side or the other. Just because two people are fighting each other does not make one good and one bad. That's not what it does. It doesn't make one good and one bad. We know in the ancient world that these kingdoms fought against each other. We know about the Assyrian that was full of darkness. And God used the Assyrian to do what? Subdue everybody around them. To even subdue his own people to put them back in check. Why did he do this? Because they stepped themselves up in pride. They began to lose his entire value system. Government was corrupted. So the Lord said, okay, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to use the Assyrian as my axe in the earth. I'm going to start pruning 
And that's exactly what the Lord did. He pruned it with the Assyrian. But what happened to the Assyrian in the end? The Bible says the Assyrian was lifted up in his own heart, thinking that by his own hand, by his own brain, by his own genius, he conquered everything. And that's when God broke the accent. He got rid of the Assyrian. With all these things, remember, also remember this. Who was Satan to the living God? Was he not the most perfect creation God ever created at that time? Yes, he was. God made him perfect. Satan beheld himself, and he saw his own perfection. That's where he messed up. Satan beheld himself, and he saw his own perfection. In many different ways, when he saw his own perfection, an evil thought entered into him, and that began his fall. What does the world teach you all the time? It's a messed up philosophy that will cause you to be successful and cold-hearted at the same time. Anybody know what that philosophy is? We want you to see yourself as successful, as the man, as the woman. They want you to look in a mirror and see yourself as this person of importance. That is a philosophy of Satan himself. That is not what your father teaches you. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. The world teaches you, be proud of your accomplishments. God says, don't do that, because without me, you wouldn't accomplish anything. You see the contrast. The world says, go and take care of you. Have some me time. I've heard, I hear people say that all the I It burns me up from the inside out when I hear these worldly terms spreading, because to me, they're poison. They're the absolute destroyers of a person's life. How do I know that? Because I had to deal with them. I'm an observer, so obviously I observed many things in the world. Listen, I saw there were times when I looked at a person's success and I said, well, wait a minute. They're doing everything in this specific way. That's why they're successful. But then when I tried, my spirit started changing and I recoiled. Anything that tried to alter my spirit, it, I just recoiled. It began to take the peace out of me. The compassion was taken out of me. Have you ever heard a person do something bad to another person? They say, well, look, I like you and everything, but this is business. You ever hear that? If they become two separate people, then they teach people how to be the most important person in the room, how to know everybody's job so you can take it. So they teach you how to covet another person's position. God doesn't do that. He doesn't teach like that. God teaches of high standards. He blesses, he maneuvers, he positions. The world teaches you to do it yourself. Never, you know how it says, never assemble yourselves with losers. The Bible teaches us to go into those dark places. Go to the ones who are kicked to the side. Go to the ones who the world won't accept. Go to the poor, go to the needy, go to the hungry. That's exactly why when they go and face the Messiah, He's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew. If Jesus will say, you didn't visit me in prison. You didn't clothe me when I was naked. You didn't give me water when I was thirsty. All these things. They're going to say, well, when did we see you thirsty? When did we see you in jail? When did we see you naked? And he'll say, what you have done to the least of these, you have done unto me. But he will also say, what you have not done to the least of these, you have not done to me. And if Christ says you didn't visit him in prison, then that means a person was living their life by worldly standards. If Christ says, you didn't clothe me when I was naked, these are people walking around with no beliefs at all. And because they're no problem, most Christians just pass these people over. They think it's okay for a person to walk around with no belief. That's the person walking around dead. Do you know that? And the hunger? What about a person who's hungry? That's physical and spiritual. How many times did a person come to you? They wanted to know something about the Bible, but because you were pressed with so many worldly issues, you had no time to share anything with that person, lest you lose your job. And see, the world makes you pick between serving the Lord and keeping your job, doesn't it? Those of you who still work, who've not been tossed out the door, this is the world you live in. We pass over lots of people, and the Lord called us for the opposite of what the world is calling us for. I naturally recoil against those things I do. Somebody said, you seem so perfect, my God, I'm far from perfect. As men call perfect, no, I'm not perfect. In fact, you call me an absolute fail. That's what you can call me. But spiritually, there's a fire in me despite what goes wrong, despite what falls apart. You can never tell if I were physically stressed out. I've been living that way for a while. Physically stressed out, pressed on every single side. But you'll never hear that come out of my mouth because my trust is in the Messiah. See, there's a constant balance and a constant fight.
people need sustenance, yes. They need certain securities, maybe. They, they, there are certain things they need. But I can guarantee you, I just don't fit the bill of the mold you're familiar with. I will not, because I'll be disconnected. See, it's important to me to be the lowest person in the whole group and to be able to communicate to everybody. You know what that means? I will never live above you. I'm not going to do it. I'll go live in a tree if necessary. But I will not be disconnected. Because you know why? If in my life everything was taken care of, how in the world can I have genuine compassion towards those who are in great need? When would I ever think about somebody who's actually hungry? You know, I get thirsty and reach my throat and say, well, I wonder if anybody else is thirsty. Don't people understand that through our own traumas, it causes us to be compassionate to others with that same trauma. So why would I want those things wiped away from my life? You ever lose your compassion towards a person or a situation? Then you look back on it and you say, oh, I can't, I can't do that again. You ever see a person who really needed help and you pass them up day to day? Later on in life, you find out the end result of their lives and you say, how in the world did I miss it? Well, if you look back, you'll find out that you, you may have been having a good time. That could have been the days of your security, the days when you were okay, the days when your mind was on doing something weird and that person was suffering, yet they walked by you every day and you couldn't even discern that they were suffering. How does that happen? I'll tell you how. It's when you're disconnected. It's when you have no suffering in your life. How can you be compassionate and sensitive to somebody else's sufferings? You can't. I'll let you know right now that the, Jesus spoke to that very thing. He said the very thing. That's why he had an issue with the Pharisees, and some of the Sadducees, all the, these guys, because they were disconnected from compassion. They weren't compassionate anymore. You know what Jesus ultimately called them? The synagogue of Satan. That's what he called them. Somebody says, why, why, does, why does it call Lucifer in the Old Testament bright morning star? But in Revelation it says Jesus is a bright morning star because Lucifer lost his position. And when it mentions him in the Old Testament, it tells you what he was. Satan was a covering chair. He was in charge of everything. He was second only to God. Not God's word, just to God, right? He was second to God. So he had a very high position. He was the greatest of all creations, Satan was. In the Old Testament, it speaks of his fall. That's what his title was long before humanity was created. Satan had that position. And then he fell. When he fell out of his position, now who is second to God? Who is the who who sits at the right hand of God? Jesus does. So Jesus has become what? The bright morning star. That's a position loss. That term bright morning star has another term called the life giver. Anything that has life. Do you guys know what the sun is when it dries up? When the sun breaks, the dew of the morning. When the sun provides heat after a cold night, it's called the bright and morning star. Did you know that? That's what it is. The sun rising is the bright morning star. Notice, he didn't just say the bright star. He said the bright morning star. That is a phase of the sun that breaks what the night carried. The life giver. Satan had that position and he fell. And he drew one third of the angels with him. And then later on, 200 more angels lost their minds and were beguiled. And in the book of Enoch, it tells you who beguiled the 200, the same one that beguiled Eve in the garden. And that word Satan is a title. The word devil is a title. And they go along with the word Leviathan. But let me, on a side note, I can't explain it right now, not enough time. In the Bible, it says that men in the world would have secrets. They would know things, absolute truths, that they would never share and hold secret. Do you not know that Leviathan is not some mystery, nor is it myth? Did you also know that Leviathan will feed? It is also in, in one, two, three, four, five books that near the end, the humans that are left in the world will feed off Leviathan. Leviathan will provide food for them. It'll be their food. In other words, they'll devour Leviathan. We'll go over that one day so you fully understand it. The Hemoth was real. It's not what you think it is. Well, they launched some of the first satellites that could pierce through the top layers of ground, they found some extraordinary things. Extraordinary things that cannot be denied. Things that you could see with your own eyes, but you would still have no choice but to deny. You would say, how is this even possible? And if you look in Genesis at the earth, the earth was in darkness, but we know that darkness was the same darkness God separated from light. And we know that darkness and light was not the sun's light or the darkness by way of the absence of the sun, but was a different darkness and light. The earth was also in chaos without God's order. Chaos is something without God's order. And because it did not have God's order, it does not mean it wasn't occupied. It's not what it means. 
Somebody said that's why they have sound worship. Yes, Satan. Listen, Satan perverts every good and precious thing God has. He'll pervert it in your minds, right? Now, Satan, knowing that title, doesn't want anybody else to have that title. So what does he do? He knew that we would be here historically. So he creates a culture that worships the sun, that nobody would ever consider the sun, nor see the power of the sun rising and what it does naturally, reflecting on a spiritual truth. This is how Satan hides many things. He, he hides things by having us reject it because it will associate us with lunatics. In the Bible, it says when Satan tells a lie, he speaks of his own, something he did in the past, something he planted in the past, he will have men dig up today. And when that happens, it distorts reality. That's right, Leviathan is in the sea. What is the sea, everybody? That word sea in the Bible, what is it? In two places, or in two places when it speaks of Leviathan, do you guys know what the word sea, what context? The word sea is not the same Hebrew word used in every contextual place. It's generalized for the sake of translation. People are the sea. Where does the beast come out of? The sea, the people. The first beast comes out of the people. What is that? Nations of the earth. That's why if we survive long enough to have an election, your spirits are going to be vexed by what happens. People who are not qualified, listen to me close because, I'm, you know, I say little hints like this and people think I'm making it up. All they have to do is keep living. I gave a warning and it's almost like that warning is obscure and I can't say it during the time when things are in operation because it causes and stirs such offense. So I'll say this before anything ever happens, despite who it is. And first and foremost, what we need as Christians is more of our Father, more of His guidance, not people, not necessarily people. The task we have is to pray for our leaders. The leaders that are coming are going to be those not qualified to be leaders at all. If you have not noticed, when you lose leadership qualifications, by the way, what is one of the greatest leadership qualifications? And if you can understand this, you're going to understand the rest of my comment. What is a leader? A leader is the best servant. A leader is not somebody who can call all the shots. A leader is the best servant because the best servant, they understand and they know what everybody needs. And when you know and understand what everybody needs, you do your best to serve those needs to the people. So therefore, the best leader is the one who's qualified to take care of the people. A servant, a pastor is a servant, a master servant. Do you know that's what a pastor is? It's what a shepherd is in that something. So the most qualified of them all are those who really understand how to take care of the people, how to take care of their needs. Not those who speak that they understand, but those who actually do it. That's a leader. Now, not everybody has leadership capabilities, right? Because they don't understand what people need. They only understand what they need. And it's okay, because God didn't make everybody a leader. There are certain things leaders will never say. Leaders don't take credit. They will never take credit for what they do. Because every true leader understands grace. Do you know that? If there were no Christianity, no religion, no anything in the world, they would say it was luck like a favored love. That's what they would say. But we understand that as grace. So every leader understands grace, which is why they never say what they did, because they understand grace. And when you understand grace, you realize it's not by yours. It just, you're not by yourself. And every leader understands there's a counterpart with grace. Every single leader understands this. An unseen counterpart with grace. Every real leader understands this. This is why a real leader will never take credit, but they're always thankful. A real leader also understands the cost. Before they ever commit to anything, they know what it's going to cost. And so they never quit. A leader will die before they quit. A real one. A fake one will just, you know, well, I got to live, so I got to change this plan. They'll change an entire plan to sustain their own lives. A real leader will never do that. Another trait of a real leader is they exist for the people they lead. Remember, they're a servant, a master servant. So they exist for the people they lead. They do not exist for themselves. And so you don't hear a leader complain. If you hear a leader complain, something is terribly wrong. And if you look back in history, right, if you're one of those historian type folks, every single leader in history that really contributed to the human race, they never complained. And they always understood grace every single time. Consequently, every leader that complained tore down 
a lot. They tore down just about everything. And what I'm telling you is this, because leaders are really servants that understand who they're leading. You have entered into a time where you will see no qualifications for leadership, sitting in leadership. You know what that's going to, you know what the end result is going to be, right? The end result is not going to be good. And everybody is not a leader, and that's okay. But when it comes to leading a country, you're going to see people who have no business in that position. You're going to see that let more, less and less qualified individuals having that position. It has deteriorated already. And the new ones coming in, all right, there's some twisted individuals coming in. There's some good ones too, but there's some twisted individuals coming in. You may not even know it, but democracy has already changed. People are talking a lot with their mouths, but the world is degrading. So talk is doing nothing. So action behind the speech. Let's be actions of provoking some other nation. That's foolishness to provoke another nation. And every time this takes place, you guys know that war starts. Someone says, Mike, how do we know if you're a leader? How do you know if you're a leader? Because you're going to have a heart to people to the point where you will lose and they will win. Listen, a leader never wins. And this is what I mean. A leader will never set his or herself up where they can ever take from the people they lead, number one. They'll never be in any type of competitive fun, theater or, or whatever you want to call it, competitive uh, arena where they would ever win over the people they serve. They won't do that. They're constantly encouraging the other people. They build morale. They don't tear it down. When you're a leader, you're truly concerned about people to the point where you, you can't think about anything else really. You have deep concerns about people to the point where you find yourself naturally working toward solutions for those individuals. And you do so tirelessly, which means it's not something you'll ever get fatigued with. Meaning, when fatigue sets in, when you're hungry, when you can't go another step, you can be motivated by people to take an additional step, even if it costs you your life. A true leader will never count his or her life above anybody else's, so they won't tuck their tails and run when the danger comes. They'll serve to the very last minute. They'll never affirm that they're right over anybody else. They'll never do that. A leader will never say, I'm right and everybody else is wrong. Leaders don't do that. Leaders are not concerned about that because they understand that that has no placement in the scheme of things. Being right and wrong has no placement. That's a motor mouth issue. That has nothing to do with leadership. True leadership, the end result, is the people. David wasn't concerned about his methodology that other people understood. He was concerned about the health and welfare of his flock. David did anything necessary for the sake of his flock. David did not complain, did he, about his flock. He didn't. And David did what was necessary even to the point of death. He would face anything for the sake of his flock. And he understood grace. It's funny how those traits exist all over the place. Now be warned, you have a lot of people who can fake these things. You'll know this way. When the chips are down, you'll find your leaders. And some of you will find a leader inside yourselves. Only when the chips are down, when everything is okay, you're going to have plenty who will come in seemingly qualified for leadership. You'll never know who they are until the chips are down. It takes conflict. It takes very bad situations to qualify that person. God did the same thing. God already knew, but he had the people know themselves. So he sets the conditions in which they operate. Some people are natural born leaders. Some are not. Everybody cannot be a leader or nothing would work. You have certain sheep out there that have no leadership capabilities, but they're golden examples of what a sheep actually is in God's eyes. You have people out there that are excellent in what they do. See, it's all about being part of one big body. And, and or actually, the leader is the lowest position. Do you know that? The leader is the lowest. But the world has it so backwards. You remember when we started COT and everybody said, oh, thanks, Mike, that was a good thing. And I asked you guys to stop doing it because... I should not be the one, you shouldn't give me a hand clap every time I talk like that. No, that's the wrong way. That that really gets me because of this. In this world, I see, I always see the congregation treat the people, the pastors and things like they're gods. It is the pastor's job to point the people to Christ, not to point the people to themselves. And then you hear some of these pastors out there, they complain when nobody says thank you. What kind of stuff is that? Yet they're still driving their Mercedes, you know, things like that. But they complain. Are you kidding me? It shouldn't be that way. In a time of great controversy, in a time of a battle, in a time when things are stressful, that's when you find out who is who, you will not know until that time comes. Those are times of qualification. Hirelings 
are going to run. That's who Satan is coming for. The Bible tells us that. When the devil comes to the hireling, the hireling is somebody who does what they do for profit. Or they wouldn't. If they can't profit from it, they're not going to do it. That's a hireling. A hireling is somebody who must receive something. They have to receive something to continue to do what they do. If they cannot receive anything, they're not going to do it. That's a hireling. And that's who Satan's coming for. Do you know that? Because the Bible says when Satan does come, the hireling is going to run and the flock is going to be scattered. The hireling will not escape. And even now, some of you are being set up to receive some of the scattered because God will reassemble his people. In other words, listen, folks, listen to me carefully on this. Until the time, the proving ground, come. You will not know who is who. Listen, it doesn't matter what the record of a person is. It does not matter what a person says. When the proving round comes, that's when you'll know. You're not going to know before then because people are born actors and actresses. When the trouble comes, those who are true leaders, they're going to come find you. They're concerned about your survival. But be warned, there are too many counterfeits. Out there are lots of counterfeits out there that will cushion you up for the biggest fall you ever had in your life. You know, the Bible is quite clear. It's just like in the Bible it says, if somebody says to you, hey, if you uh, do this for me, I'll do double for you. And I'm paraphrasing, of course, but the Bible says when somebody does this, something is wrong already. When somebody is willing to give you twice back what you just gave to them, something is wrong with the deal in the first place. That's what you got to watch for, people who put too, too much cotton under the pillow. Listen, when a true leader looks at a person, they're concerned about the person's survival, not the person's comfort. Never the person's comfort, but that person's survival counts. Most people who are comfortable are ready to die. Most people who are uncomfortable get up on their feet, don't they? God makes you uncomfortable all the time to get you on your feet. If we were comfortable all of our lives, we wouldn't do anything. We wouldn't learn anything. The Lord takes the cotton out of our mattresses and pillows. The hard floor we do feel. And we say, oh, i got to get up because my back hurts. Well, there you go. When you're up on your feet, you're active. You're doing things. If the bed is too comfortable, everybody's going to roll over and do nothing. Now, my initial question was, who's raising you? Most of you admitted Christ. Just about all of you said Christ. But here it is. You ready? All throughout my life, I've heard a lot of complaints. When a person complains about their own life, they're complaining about the way Jesus is raising them. He does so on an independent basis for each of us. And when a person complains about their life, and they say, well, nothing was right in my life and everything was wrong, they have a complaint about how Jesus is raising them especially if they're Christian. Now, somebody who's out there in the world, of course they're going to have complaints because they don't understand the Messiah. Somebody who knows Christ, who realizes that from their birth on this earth, they have never been alone. They have never been exiled. They're not here for punishment or any of those things. That Jesus has been right there this entire time. That they were called to Christ because God loves them. God put the belief of Christ in us that we would call on Christ at a specific time. When people complain about their lives, like that, they don't trust the way Jesus is raising them. Do you guys understand? And that really has to be looked at. That's why I encourage people always to find Christ in your life. Find Christ in your past. A lot of people used to ask me, why did I go through child abuse and all this? Why was I raped a million times when I was young? And there are audios where I went over the whole thing. Essentially this. When a person goes through those traumatic experiences when they're young, when they're innocent like that, they face a true devil. And when they face that true devil, they never forget it because it leaves a scar on them. Now, that person may think that scar just takes away from them. No, it doesn't. It enables them. They've been face to face with something that hides from everybody else. That same person who went through that traumatic time can go out in the populace and they can spot that spirit anywhere. They can spot people that spirit has touched Nobody else can do that. So then that means you've been enabled. You've been raised in a way that you survived a face-to-face -face confrontation with darkness. God had you survive it because he gave you the language to talk to those who were going through it right now. And by the way, what you went through is increasing in the world. But just like you, they're not going to tell it to everybody because they're embarrassed by it. God had you go through it first so that you could go to another person and say, listen, by the spirit, I understand what you're going through with. It's OK. So that supernatural appointment can be set up. They'll listen to you because you know what they've gone through. They won't listen to me. They're not going to listen to somebody who's who's not been raped when they were young gentlemen you've gone through the same thing. It's not so you can be embarrassed or scarred or minimized from the world. No. 
You're in this world, not of this world. God doesn't want you a part of this world. He said, come out of her, my people. Be not partakers of her sins that you don't partake of her plagues. But you've gone through it so you could be first. Because you know when somebody goes through that, that's the last thing they talk about. They don't volunteer that information. Somebody asked me the other day, why would a Christian be abducted? So they can deal with darkness in a very peculiar way. So they can identify the fingerprints of the darkness that touches people like that. And by the Spirit. Oh, they can be of such use. See, when you went through your troubles, you said, Lord, send somebody, rescue me, get me out of this situation. Nothing came, did it? You were stuck like Chuck, just like me. Nothing came. But guess what? When you grew up, you prayed for someone that God sent you anybody. So you know what the Lord did? He answered your prayer. He answered that prayer by sending you. You became the answer to your own prayer. You said, Lord, send me someone. What you didn't realize is someone else was going to have the same prayer. God prepared you to be an answer to somebody else's prayer. And you know what? That goes for all of you. Not just one or two. That goes for every single last one of you. You're an answer to somebody else's prayer. You won't operate in that capacity until you find Christ in your past. Do not curse your past because your father's been part of your life since day one. Don't curse your past. That's what the world does because they don't understand it. Time to come out of the world in the ways of the world. Come out of that thinking the world does. It's not working out so good for the world, is it? So don't emulate that. You've been sent the exact prayer you had. You've been prepared to answer for somebody else. If you stay in the world, you're going to become a recluse. You won't have that divine appointment. Don't become a recluse. Trust the Lord's guidance. There are too many out there that are suffering in silence. They're deeply hurt, hoping that someone will come. And you have been fully qualified. So don't sit there and condemn yourselves. Stop saying you're a reject or something like that. You've been bought with a price. That's, you're not a reject. You belong to the Most High. If you did not, you would not believe in Christ. Don't you know that God gave you the faith that you have to believe in Christ? So stop being the expert on what you are in that negative fashion. Stop being the resolve for your own crises. Start walking in faith. Your crisis is nothing more than water. So go walk on the water. You're not to walk in the water, you're to walk on the water. You get up on top of your crises and walk anyway. Don't let anything stop you. That's exactly what Satan wants, for you to see that person in that grocery store and never say a word. For you to suspect that person you just passed and never do anything. That's what he wants. For you to keep you, just stay to yourself. Stay in your crisis of mind to never put anything together of truth. So you'll have no effect on anybody in the world. And half the people like that go out and pick something easier they can do. Well, I, I can't do that, but I can do this easy thing. Forget about that. You were made that your skin. Listen, something rises up in you when people start talking about that subject. Surely it's rising now. This is part of who you are. That strength you feel, that strong dislike you feel, that's part of who you are. You're not supposed to like that thing. That's how it gets to people because people like that spirit in somebody else. And as soon as that spirit gets somebody alone, you know what happens. You're repelled by it. You're not drawn to it. You know exactly what it is. The Lord sent you first. That's why you walk around with that strong yearning that somebody do something about that situation. Isn't that what you say? They ought to do something about that. Well, guess what? Your father sent you. Listen to me. You know what the greatest strength Satan has? You know what his greatest strength is? His greatest strength is to remain hidden. He can't hide around you. I can guarantee you that some of you, you saw somebody with a child, you walked near them, and the child looked right into your eyes as though they were speaking, and the parents shuffled that child away. If that child could express with their mouth in that day what they had in their hearts and what they saw in you, you have to learn to lose control. You have to let control go. You've been taught to control things your entire life or bad things will happen. Jesus told us the world does not have the truth. And if you're operating your life by keeping control, you're operating your life by a mechanism that's very destructive. If you have control and you're maneuvering all the pieces, what have you left for your father to maneuver? The scripture says, in our weakness, his strength is made perfect or his strength is perfected. Why? Because when we are weak, we can't do anything else. And God can actually do something in our lives. So long as we're doing something, have you noticed he does not force your hands off things? And that's the problem. You've got to learn to lose control. You've got to let it go. 
because it's either your plan or the Lord's plan. Now, with your plan, it may look good on paper. It may seem like it's working out. I can assure you, there are going to be empty spots. You've got to learn to lose control. you got to get your hands off of it. You know, when, you, when the Lord gives you an unction, this internal knowing about something, and in your heart of hearts you want to do it, the reason why you don't do it is because you're in total control. It may not be in your planning. You've got to learn to lose control. When a person will not hear you, it's because you're speaking at a time that you authorized. Not exactly a time that God has divinely set up. That comes from your control. You have the right message, but you have to have the right timing. And do you know what timing people have? They have the devil's timing. People have horrible timing. They do everything at the wrong time. We also have very little patience when it comes to seeing an outcome of something. You have to learn to lose control. You have to take your hands off of things and become a steward. See, a steward is not a control freak so to speak. That's not what they are. A steward is somebody who makes sure things are ready to be utilized. That's not controlling things. you got to be ready that you're ready to be utilized. Not control everything. You can't set up the appointment that only God can set up. Like a relationship. How many people have had bad relationships? Just about everybody, right? Do you know why? Because we set up the timing of things. You could have had the perfect person for your life and messed it all up. You know why? Here's how God works. When two people are about to get together, right? Does not God have to prepare one for the other? Of course he does. God will always prepare both halves. So he'll send one through life trials and another through life trials. And when God sets that divine appointment, they can absolutely become one flesh. And it's all worked out. When we set it up, we rush everything. We get together and then we have life trials together which normally separate people. They haven't gone through preliminary trials of faith separately, that they find out who they are indeed, that they can absolutely be one flesh. What normally happens is, in a relationship that mends too early, one person is going to lose their identity, period. They're going to have to become a different person just to stay in the relationship, and then Satan walks in. When that happens, it's all over, because people aren't waiting on the Father. They say, oh, i got to have somebody now. i got to see you're in control again. So what do you do? You go out and get somebody now. You start working on that. That's where your mind is. You won't stop till you get it operating by what? Not love, lust. You can love somebody, but you can also let lust drive your timing. Well, that's stinky timing. It's not God's timing. That's almost like a person that says, well, God bless me with a new car. Really? Where'd you get it from? Oh, the car dealership. I got a good deal. It was only $40,000. So you're making payments? Yeah. Well, how's that a blessing? If you're making payments, you're getting ripped off, period. That's it. How's that a blessing? You just blessed yourself because you wouldn't wait upon the Lord. People in your family, you want them to listen to a certain word of Christ so they can, because you hear them saying things that are incorrect, right? Matter just don't line up with the Bible and you're saying, oh, they got to have the truth or they're not going to make it. Well, wait a minute, because somebody said that to you in your life. See, because when you were 16, you didn't believe at the age of 16 the way you believe now. Who gave you the time? to get everything right. That's called grace. God gave you grace. He's going to give them grace too. You don't trust that he's going to give them grace. I hear people say all the time, oh, stuff is going to happen. I'm so afraid they're not going to make it because they didn't know. That's not the way our father works. That's like a lawyer. Lawyers do that. Sneaky people do that. It's not the way the father works. The father will present to everybody the absolute truth before they go anywhere. He's not going to trick anybody or withhold something from somebody so they can just be condemned. Grace gives us time. And if something is going to happen within the next year, grace will speed up upon everybody and so will his knowledge increase upon everybody. People are going to be drawn and they're going to go through fast trials. That means everybody will start to go through everything all at one time. And when you see that, you better believe a season is coming. You're in the middle of that right now, just in case you didn't know. Why would God do this? Because everybody is going to have their opportunity. And it's not up to you whether they say yes or no. It doesn't matter how much you love them. They will choose what they choose based upon the truth of their hearts, the truth of their spirit. God doesn't just ask him one time. If he just asked us something one time and we had to give a verbal response, all of us would be doomed for lying. Because we said yes to Christ and without sin a week later. What are you kidding me? All of us would be condemned. No, here's how it works. You say yes the first time. You find out you've been messing up over here. You finally get the courage to let go of this sin. All this happens throughout your life. And your yes is more qualified than the first time or the time before. So as you go through your process, your yes becomes a yes. 
At the beginning, your yes is not a pure yes. But by the time of the end, you will have become what you truly are. In that way, when you say you feel sorry for those who won't make it, we don't know what we're talking about. That only happens in the realm of men when they cheat on timing. When people don't know what time the appointment was, they say, well, you missed the appointment, so sorry. God doesn't work that way. God works in the realm of truth. He's doing all of what he does by way of love. Never forget that. And people are responsible for their own answers. He's not looking for the words. Over time, we give an answer of truth. Because in my life, when the Lord said, do you trust me? I said, oh, yes, I do. But then a trial came, and I didn't want that trial. I didn't trust him. Because the first thing I said was, Lord, take this problem away so I can have my peace back. Now when a trial comes, I don't pray against the trial. I look towards Christ. I learn. I say, Lord, what is this? What is this? And then the more I look, the more I discover things I can never discover outside of that trial. Inside a trial is your true identity. You're going to find out in the end that only by way of a trial can you ever discover things about you. You'll never find it outside of a trial. There are certain blocks of wisdom that were given to me that can only be had inside of severe trials. They cannot be obtained outside of those severe trials. There are certain words that I had spoken and boasted about that they had to be qualified. I didn't understand that at first. I do now, so I don't brag lest I've been proven in that area. And I'm willing to go back through that again. How many of you are ready to go back into a crisis again? Because if you're not, I suggest you don't brag about how strong your faith is. Oh, absolutely how much you trust in the Lord. Because every time you do this, it's going to be qualified of you in truth. And for your words to be qualified in truth means you have to live through it again. So when you argue with somebody, say, oh, no, my faith is strong in the Lord. It's going to be tried that that person will see the truth of you. God always demonstrates to the adversary the truth of a person regardless of what they have said. You have to learn to let go. You have to learn to not have control. To not cross every T and dot every I. Be a good steward, yes. That means take care of those things that the Lord has given you, your tools that you have in life. Part of stewardship is to take care of your tools. It is not to control every aspect of your life and everybody else's life that touches you and use those tools for a control mechanism that's forbidden. That's why things backfire. That's all you have to do. Is it an easy lesson to extract? No, it isn't. Or everybody would have let go of control a long time ago. I want you guys to think of something. If five people were talking and every all five believe that, uh, say, the interpretation of Revelation is different, then who has the truth? And how can the people be edified by five different versions of that truth? They can't. Only confusion. So what would be a, a, a very true way to express one's opinion in that or, or one's mind in that situation? To agree that God's right. To agree that we don't know as much as we claim to know. Oops, there it is. That's operating in the realm of truth. People don't operate in the realm of truth automatically starting from day one. They lie to themselves and they say they do and the Bible is clear about that. It's like a person that says, I have not sinned. God says there are liars. It would almost be like a person say, well, I have absolutely no fear. Sure you don't. I said that once. For many years, I believed it until I had a dream. And in that dream, I was so scared I couldn't believe it. I said, my goodness, I, I would have never known that was still there. I've learned something about dreams. If you do it in a dream, you'll do it in real life. It's a potential that resides within you. Some dreams are given to expose that potential that you may bring that before the Lord to have that removed. He's not going to remove it automatically because you would never thank him, nor would it increase your faith. If you don't know what he just fixed, you must know what he has delivered you from. That's important. You would never give God glory if you never knew what he delivered you from. If he took care of your problems outside of your knowledge, how would you thank him? You wouldn't. You would think that what your way is working, and then you would begin to brag on how you believe. That's also forbidden. Those things must be qualified. Somebody says, uh, can anybody show me a scripture of the process? How about this one? God is not slack concerning his promises, as men count slackness, but as long suffering to usward, desiring that none of us perish outside of him. But that one, 
He's not slack concerning his promises. That's when the people came and said, where, where's the promise of his coming? Where is he at? He isn't here. Well, God is not slack concerning. Uh, um, he's not slack as men count slackness, but he's long suffering to us. Well, if he's long suffering, he's waiting for something. And if he's waiting for something, and he's the one that said he sends us trials and tribulations, which is why we glory in tribulation, knowing what it's working, right? And eventually that trial or that tribulation is going to increase our hope in Christ. It's going to work out many things in our lives. That's called a process. A process is something that does not happen all at one time, but it happens over duration of time. That's called a process. Jesus said, when you see Israel or Jerusalem encamped about by her enemies, look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. He also said, he that endures until the end, the same shall be saved. He didn't say that person was absolutely secure where they were right now. No, the one who endures until the end, which means if you give up, you're gone, you're lost. Do you know why? Because if somebody truly accepted the gift of salvation they're never going to give up because that gift is precious to them if we run and we don't faint see how all those scriptures imply a process but i want you guys to understand that what you're going through is purposed all of it means something never let satan tell you that never let him tell you that you went through something you didn't have to go through no if you didn't have to go through it you would have not gone through it because you believe in christ and remember this scripture, Jesus said, all who come to me, the Father hath given me, and I will in no wise lose. So then even you believing in Christ is not your doing, that's God's doing. He put that belief in you so that you would eventually cry out for Christ once you were exposed to darkness. Understand that, understand that. So Satan can never lie to you because we do live in the days of a, a demonstrative disclosure. You guys are about to be introduced I'm telling you, the world's going to take a turn that no one is speaking about. People are not prepared for what is about to be presented. And you're talking about shock and awe on a level you never thought was coming. It's coming. And please don't brag, never brag in the area saying, well, if I saw something extraordinary, it won't do anything to me. Don't say that. People are dying to see something like that. Listen to me. They're dying. They're itching. It's going to do something to your flesh unless you have been burned out on that subject. Unless you've been burned out on that subject and with the entities and have had personal experiences in this and the other. Until you're burned out, it's going to cause excitement. In that respect, you're going to need every ounce of your faith and resolve in Christ. It's going to require trust because you can, there are people right now, as much as you love the Lord, as much as you love the truth, there are people right now that love those things and they don't even know what they are. People feel good around them. It's, it's very difficult to explain. It's almost like an atmosphere of everything's going to be okay is around them. They don't speak with words like we do. They will communicate almost spirit to spirit if you let them. They can set the atmosphere around you. You can feel totally embraced by them, which is a total lie because God said you would never have that here in this place. This is not your paradise. They're the ones trying to, they, they, this is not your paradise. But now everybody's jumping on board to paint a picture so that you fall right in line. The more they introduce, the more people are going to fall away and start believing. And weird concepts of fables will come all the way back. Do you hear me? How many Christians would love to have proof of Christianity? Many of you guys have already admitted that if your family members had proof of certain things in Christianity, they would believe your side of the story. Well, let me ask you this. If they had proof concerning something else, would they believe that too? Yep. Because that's what's driving people. They have conditioned people. To wait for proof and when they get that proof they're going to support it 100 percent those will be painful days prepare yourselves by having the word in you having a response ready which means make sure the holy spirit can freely indwell in you without resistance get yourselves ready for full occupation of the holy spirit it's like an encyclopedia will be set into you you'll be able to recall what you need to recall when you need to recall it and you'll always have the Lord's help. And all this goes hand in hand with physical things like the weather and the heavens. Powerful demonstrations will come from the heavens. A few are on schedule for a very close time frame. There, there are some things we need to prep for. I can give you my advice on preparation. I, I cannot tell you how to prepare. But your father can. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He has not. He will not. And I can show you where those preparations are found in the Bible. Because he's given us good advice and good instruction 
know exactly what we need to do. Michael, someone had a question. Do the saints in heaven pray for us in Revelation 5, 8? Are the saints' prayers in heaven? Well, if the saints are in heaven, right? The saints that are in the heavens, they're with Christ. Jesus intercedes for you. He's the mediator for us. Jesus is. Correct? That's what the Bible teaches. Jesus is praying for you. The prayers of the saints that ascend to the heavens originated here on the earth. That's why they ascend to the heavens. Those who were under the altar, they're praying that the Lord's word be completed. And he told them to wait for a little while. That's a hint of what they were praying for. Because they were saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not avenge your blood upon the earth? And, and so they were saying that. But Christ is our mediator. Anybody on earth who believes in Christ is empowered. The Lord's ears and his eyes are upon you. He's listening for your prayer. He intercedes for you. And we, in obedience and out of compassion, intercede for each other. To intercede is never to force your way into somebody's situation. To intercede in somebody's situation is a petition of agreement of the work Jesus is doing in somebody's life. Because, by the way, who would ever pray against Christ in somebody's life? Who would ever just make up something and speak against the will of God in somebody's life? I would not. But I often ask the Lord to extend his mercy upon a person that he has extended to me. To extend his grace upon a person he has extended to me. When I pray in the open, is so that you guys can hear what I'm praying about. That's when I pray in the open. Otherwise, I don't pray in the open. Because the Bible said the Lord knows, and, and when it comes to needs, the Lord knows what we have need of before I ask. I never ask for anything I need from the Lord, because he already knows. I will ask him for wisdom, for understanding that I may communicate things a little clearer. But I need not ask him for anything from us. I know it's contrary to what most people have been taught, but I believe in the word. I already know God knows exactly what I need. So I trust him to provide me with what's necessary for my walk in this earth. But I do pray for understanding in certain areas. I do not consider that and I never forget my prayers. I can absolutely dictate all the, my prayers. I can dictate them. I just don't. Listen, prayer is a serious conversation with, with the Lord. If you forget your own prayers, I, I'm going to ask you something. What good was the prayer? If you needed something from someone, but you forgot what you needed, would you still ask him? No. And if you didn't receive it, would you even know you didn't receive it? No, because you forgot what you asked for. When you're making a petition to the Lord, remember who you're presenting your petition to. Remember who you're going to talk to. Have all respect.